question I'll have you raise your hands. I'm about to ask you how many of you are puzzle people meaning you like to do puzzles all right and I'm talking about like this kind of puzzle not like a crossword puzzle but like the piece thing. How many of you are puzzle people? All right now we know who the weirdos are in the room. Uh, we've identified them. Um, so let's do a little participate group participation. I want to know because I just don't get it, so I need to know why. All right so if you're willing if you're one of those puzzle people uh, just shout it out at me why? Over anybody over here? Why do you like puzzles? Patience. patience. It helps you to live with Lee. Then is what you develop patience, right? Okay. All right. So it's. It, uh, ooh, okay. How many? Of, anybody else? Other people? Why you love puzzles? Ooh, a finished product when you're done. That's good. They're annoying. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay, so you see this larger thing than come together. Anybody else? 
Okay, let's just do this one. How many of you, if you think puzzles are relaxing, if you're one of those puzzle people, raise your hand, relaxing. Wow, I don't get it at all. I, I just don't. Um, see, for me, the opposite of tr is true. And I'm guessing for those of you who don't like puzzles, you'll feel the same way. Doing a puzzle makes me want to scratch my eyes out, right? It's, maybe it's, it's the lack of patience that I have. I find it completely unrelaxing. A while, I guess it was a year or two ago, wasn't it, Charlotte, that we had a puzzle that I was like, you know what, I came home from work, I don't know what got into me, or it was a Saturday, I was like, I'm going to do a puzzle. I just, I just felt it, and so I was like, I'm doing this puzzle today. And by the end of the night, everybody in the house was miserable because I was so angry at this puzzle that I was trying to do, and I did finish the puzzle. Now, growing up, Dad and James were kind of into puzzles. I don't know if, like... My dad, my brother, and Charlotte all kind of like puzzles. Me and my mom do not. I don't know if there's like some personality traits you could see and like <laughs> chill versus not chill, probably what's happening. Um, but I remember dad and James especially went through a puzzle phase growing up. And I, and my grandparents did puzzles. It was one of those things where they would, they would just have a puzzle set out for weeks at a time. And we're just going to walk by and just do a little piece here. And, and they're like, you, you're welcome to do a piece. And it's like, I'm not touching that thing. But I'll admit, when, when James and Dad went through the little puzzle phase, and the, Dad still does puzzles, but I always, now I'm not like this anymore. I'd never do this to you now, Dad, when you do a puzzle. But when it was James and Dad, I always wanted to walk by and just like grab one every day. One piece every day. And pocket them and just... And here's why I wanted to do that, because I wanted them, when they got to the end of that puzzle, I wanted them to experience what I experienced just doing puzzles, pure frustration. And the reason that you would experience frustration, if you're a puzzle person, I'm guessing if you get to the end of the puzzle and there's two or three pieces missing, that's frustrating for you. And all of a sudden, it's not as relaxing as maybe you would want it to be. And the reason that's the case is very obvious, right? Every piece of the puzzle is vitally important. Like, that makes sense. Like, if you're doing a puzzle and you're missing, let's say you've got a thousand pieces and one is missing. Now, you, if you're real chill, probably like some of you are, you'd be like, oh, it's no big deal. But I'm guessing there's just a little bit of frustration. If there's like five pieces missing out of a thousand, you know that that is, that is half a percent, that is less than one percent. No big deal, right? Well, no, it turns out that five pieces missing from a puzzle is a pretty big deal, even if it's less than 1% of the pieces, because every piece of the puzzle is important. Whether you like puzzles or don't like puzzles, you recognize that. Now, the obvious parallel here is when it comes to the body of Christ, this is so obvious, and you know this was coming, you knew this was coming, every piece of our puzzle, every person, every part of the family of God is vitally important. Maybe another way to illustrate this is to think about a potluck. You know what makes a really good potluck? It's amazing that there's not a lot of great potluck pictures on the internet. Uh, this is just one of, the, of a dessert table. What makes a really great potluck is when everybody brings their best dish. Or what makes for a really great dessert table is when everybody brings their favorite or best dessert. Everybody comes together and all of a sudden, all of that comes together for a fantastic meal. And I don't know, maybe when it comes to your relationship with the church or your relationship with the body of Christ, you're kind of left asking, what do I bring to the table? Now, when it comes to a pot, like, you know, you got to bring your, your best or whatever. But when it comes to your relationship with this church, I'm imagining some of you still wonder sometimes, like, maybe you've been a, around a long time and you're still asking, like, what do I bring to the table? And while scripture doesn't talk about puzzles or potlucks, it does talk about the body of Christ. If you want to turn your Bibles over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and while you're turning there, let me explain. You may be saying, hey, why aren't we doing Hebrews today? Here's my explanation. So I, was, I had a little mini series planned here in a couple of weeks, just a little two-week series to take a break from Hebrews. And, and it dawned on me that really I do all of those, a lot of those little mini series when the students are here and so they miss out on, on Hebrews. And I thought, you know what, they need Hebrews and so combine that with, this is a theme that I think the church here at Stantonville needs to talk about. Like this is something, especially with the growth we've experienced, we've got new people. And so I wanted to spend a couple of Sundays, today and next week, when it's a lot of our, our local members just talking about what it looks like to be the body of Christ and how that, that plays out. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to open up in 
verses 12 through 14. I'm going to have these verses on. We're going to, here's what I'm doing today. I'm just doing verses 12 to 20 today, all right? We'll jump in next week and do the rest of the passage. We're going to kind of stop right in the middle so we can talk about what this looks like. But here's where we are today. I'll have these verses on the screen. Now, context is important, right? In Corinth, it appears that some were equating spirituality with how spectacular a gift was. So if you could speak in tongues or you had the gift of prophecy, you were more spiritual than everybody else. And so in chapters 12, 13, and 14, he goes out, Paul sets out to address that. And what he does in chapter 12, he says, listen, we're all diff- we all have different gifts and abilities, but we're one body. Chapter 13, he reminds him, it doesn't matter what gifts you have. If you're not serving in love, then it's, it doesn't matter. And then chapter 14, he kind of gets into the specifics of these two uh, spiritual gifts of speaking in tongues and, and prophecy. So here's what he says about the diversity of the body. Jumping in in verse 12. Just as the body is one and has many members, all right, so this is basic stuff, right? You understand that our physical bodies, we have one physical body, but it has many parts, many different parts, all of them working together to create this one body. And all the members of the body, though many, are one body. He kind of repeats himself. This is just obvious stuff. If, if you're a kid, this is easy to understand, isn't it, right? We have one body, but all these different members are parts of our body. And then here's the key phrase. So it is with Christ, right? For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Here in a few minutes, we'll, we'll sing a, an invitation song, which is our tradition And if you've never put on Christ in baptism, if you're curious, how can I become a member of the body? Well, here's the answer. We're baptized into the body of Christ. But it doesn't matter who you are, Jew or Greek. Slaves are free and all were made to drink of one spirit. So it's a beautiful description of the diversity of the body of Christ. We've got people from different, all sorts of different backgrounds in here, right? We've got... We got Tennessee fans and Alabama fans started to start my sermon with Lamentations this morning for both all of you guys, but I didn't. But we got people from different parts of the country. We got, we've got different, I'm guessing, we got people from all over the world maybe, even with some of our guests. So we've got people from all over the place, but as the body of Christ, we're, we're one. We come from different econ- economic backgrounds. Some of you maybe grew up very poor. Maybe you don't have a lot of money now. Some people have have more financially. We come from different backgrounds, but as the body of Christ, isn't it beautiful? We all come together as one. We are one body. Now, the obvious parallel then is, of course, what a puzzle looks like, right? That's what makes a puzzle cool is when it all comes together, you've got all these different pieces that look different. You've got kind of the boring pieces like the sky pieces or and then you've got the real colorful one or the faces that are easier. to. All these different pieces, they come together to make one, one puzzle, right? Or a car, for example. I, I just did a quick search to find a picture like this and I think I read something like 20,000 different parts are, are come together to make one vehicle. Or you've got all these different parts of a vehicle that do what? They form one vehicle. So it is with the body of Christ. Lots of different parts, but one, one body. And it's beautiful when you bring all of that together. So to illustrate this just a little bit more, um, I, I bought a Mrs. Potato Head. <laughs> okay, now you say, why did you do Mrs. Potato Head and not Mr. Potato Head? Here's why, because Mrs. Potato Head got here in two days. Mr. Potato Head wasn't going to get here for multiple days. I don't know if there's any parallels, like Mr. Potato Head was on it, the guy, Mr. Potato Head was just going to run late. Um, So what's fun with playing with a Mr. or Mrs. Potato Head is you've got all these different parts, right? So the kids have played with these, maybe, I mean, this is old school toy. How many, like, is, how old, does this go back to, like, way back, like, okay, it must go way back, right? So it goes way, way back to, um, to the childhood of some folks who've been around for a while. So this is a toy, you've got this one body um, and then you've got all these different parts right but what makes Mrs. Potato Head fun to play with is that you put all of these parts on and even though the parts are different right they all come together to make one Mrs. Potato Head lots of different parts but one one body or one Mrs. Potato Head and so it is Paul says with the body of Christ many parts but we are all one we're one body let's keep reading 
He says, for the body does not consist of one member. When you see that word member, think part. One part, but of many. And so imagine then if we're Mrs. Potato Head, imagine that, see, she can't even stand up without her foot, right? Imagine the foot saying, if the foot should say, Paul's words here, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. Now, we would say that that's, that's ridiculous. The foot's not going to say, well, I'm not a hand, so I'm not a part of the body. That would, make it, that would not make it, Paul says, any less a part of the body. So just because the foot says, I'm not a part of that, or, or some member of a church says, well, I'm not a hand, so I don't belong, I don't, no. All the different parts come together to make the body. And if the, for example, if the ear should say to the eye, or if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. This is such a vivid illustration by Paul, isn't it? He could have, there's a lot of ways that he could have said that, and that's one of the beautiful things about Scripture is it illustrates itself so beautifully, and here he could have just said, he could have done Mr. Pate Head with this. He's saying, listen, just because these parts are different and have different abilities and are used by the body in different ways doesn't make any of them any less valuable, right? No, all of the parts of Mrs. Potato Head, all of the parts of the body are important. And obviously, when it comes to the body of Christ, all of the parts, all of the members of the body of Christ, though different, are vitally important. He continues, if the whole body were an eye. Now, imagine that I ordered this Mrs. Potato Head for about eight bucks. See, it's not, it's not bad at all. If I ordered this and all that came in the box was maybe her, her body and the eyes, do you think I would have been disappointed by that? Yeah, I would have sent it back. It would not have been a complete set of Mrs. Potato Head, right? You've got to have, he says, if it, the whole body was an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? Or if the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? When I was thinking about like the different abilities of the body and the different parts of the body that play different roles. And we're going to continue this conversation next week. I, I thought about a, a, a team, right? Now, I don't, I don't know who all plays what position on the volleyball team, but I'm guessing there are different ones of you that play different positions and different talents are represented. Not everybody plays the same position. This year for the Pittsburgh Pirates, our first baseman was a guy by the name of Rowdy Telez. And he struggled early on, but then he got going, and everybody would cheer and chant, Rowdy, Rowdy, and he became a fan favorite. But I think one of the reasons he became a fan favorite is because he looks like this. He's a big dude, right? He doesn't look like your typical baseball player. Now, here's the thing. He was a great first baseman. Well, he was a pretty good first baseman, hit some home runs for us. But if everybody on the Pittsburgh Pirates was about that size, how do you think that, what if you had a center fielder? It was about the size of Rowdy Telez. For that matter, just imagine the whole team, the size of Rowdy Telez. How would that go? You'd hit a lot of home runs, but you wouldn't steal any bases, probably, and you probably wouldn't catch many fly balls in the gap in the outfield, or really anything hit beyond two or three feet. Like, you need a variety of different guys. You need a big dude like this on a team to hit home runs and play first base. But you don't want a whole team like that, right? You need variety. If the whole team were a big, brute first baseman, that, that wouldn't be a team, right? You need multiple pieces of the puzzle. And then watch how Paul wraps this up. He says, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be, right? So you understand how something like this works, sort of. Like it takes every single part of Mrs. Potato Head to make this thing work and to make this thing look sort of normal. I'm bound to, that's not her ear, that's her nose. See, isn't it easy to get these things confused? So you got noses and ears, it takes all of this. How long will it take me to put Mrs. Potato Head together? Still missing a foot. All of this comes together to make one Mrs. Potato Head. Now you could stop here and say, that still looks kind of weird, right? Sort of. It's got the little holder for a mouth. Like, you need every part, right? Now, once you get all the pieces of Mrs. Potato Head together, now we've got something that looks sort of normal with Mrs. <laughs> Potato Head, right? These are just a little bit strange, I acknowledge. And so Paul says, as he wraps this up, if all were a single member, where would the body be? Like, if this whole thing was an ear, it would look ridiculous. 
As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Many parts, one Mrs. Potato Head. Many pieces of the puzzle, but one puzzle. Even with all of the differences, as those differences, as those different pieces come together. Somebody said this, right? It's fun to see all of these different pieces come together to create something bigger in many cases, something that looks very, very nice. As I read this passage, I think there's some principles that I think we should walk away from. So here they are real quick. Number one, every part of the body of Christ is important. Every, you take away an ear from Mrs. Potato Head and she doesn't look right anymore. You lose one piece of a puzzle and it's, there's something frustrating, it's not complete. Every piece of the puzzle, every part of the body of Christ is vitally important. Secondly, I think we learn that then that every part is needed. Next week, as we continue reading this passage, we'll see that even the parts that seem unimportant are needed. Because every part is important, every part is needed, and therefore, if you are a part of the body of Christ, or whatever the case may be, you need to be connected to the body. Right? You can't be a, an ear out here on your own. Like That ear does nothing on Mrs. Potato Head if it's sitting off by itself. It's got to be connected to the body for this thing to work right, to look right. So it is with the body of Christ. You've got, you can't be off on your own. You've got to be connected to the body to be a fully functioning follower of Jesus. And I think that's what Paul reminds us of. So I come back to that initial question. Right? We ask the question, what do I bring to the table? If you've struggled with that or thought about that and, and you're curious, let me just give you a simple answer to this, all right? What do you bring to the table? I'll just say, tell you this. You need to bring what you have. Bring what you have to the table because what you have, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, is vital to the body. What you bring to the table is vital. So just bring what you have. Now, I know what some of you are saying. Well, I don't really have anything to bring. Right? Maybe it's, maybe it's the teenagers who are like, well... You know, you know, just like a little bit of, mm -mm, I don't got nothing. I know he said I do. I don't have anything. I promise you, what you have is vital to the body. Like, what you can bring, what all of you can bring is vital to the body. And here's what you can bring. If you're like, I don't know about this, Matt, here's what it is. You have unique talents, a unique personality, and unique experiences that other people do not have. This is what you bring to the table. And every person in here has something here. Now, again, I'm not picking on the teenagers. I'm just imagining this, like, I imagine you guys being like, uh-uh, I don't, I don't have any talents. I don't got nothing. And, you know, it's, maybe, it's, maybe it's some of you who are a little older who could play that game a little, I don't have, I don't have anything. And it's just a little bit of, like, sad, and you feel kind of, I'm telling you, you've got something to bring to the table. Think about your talents. There are some of you in this room who have talents that nobody else has. And I want to challenge you to think outside the box. When it comes to the talents that God gave us, it's not about necessarily standing on a stage and doing something. It's about the talents that he gives you to use all week long for his glory. So what talents do you have that you could use in that way? You know, if you're, if you're good at sports, you say, oh, that that's, has nothing to do with being a part of the body of Christ. Well, yeah, that's how can you use your athletic abilities? To serve others and to, by serving others, serve God. Maybe it's just as simple as like paying attention to a little kid at church who thinks you're really cool because of your athletic abilities. Or maybe, let's get really like thinking outside the box. Maybe for the teenagers, you say, well, I know what my talent is. I'm really good at video games. And you're like, that has nothing to do with God. Well, could you not play video games with people who are not Christians and connect with them in that way? And that's the way that you could use your talents that many in here don't have to, to serve God and to serve others. Or maybe you say, what do you mean by personality? Some people, here's a simple example. Of, some people like to talk a little bit more than others. You know what, you can, you can use that. If, you can, if you're good, at, if you're comfortable and like to talk, then work the room. Talk to, talk to some, if you're younger, talk to some older people. If you're older, talk to some younger people. Use that natural talent, not just to connect with the people you know the best, but with everybody in the room. Some of you are, are quieter, and so you're like, well, what, hmm, what are you going to do with that, Matt? I'm, I'm, I'll tell you what, you can, you can listen. You're, you're usually, quieter people are more natural, and they're better at, at listening to others. What would it look like for you to use that natural part of your personality to listen to others? And then, this one's obvious, everybody in this room has a unique set of experiences that allows them to connect with others like nobody else could. 
I really enjoyed Rick's class this morning in our adult Bible class. I didn't know his story. And so he's got some parts of his story that allows him to connect with other people that maybe no, no, nobody else in here could. Or that I couldn't. Or maybe they're, from my experience, I can connect with people that, that Rick can or that others in the room can't. Right? We all have experiences. And here's the problem. Some of these experiences are experiences we wish we didn't have. That if we could go back, we'd say, yeah, I think I'd throw that experience out the window. But could it be that God could use your experience, whatever that may be, to serve someone else, to listen to someone else, to show the love of Christ to someone else? What do you bring to the table? You just bring what you have. And all of us have something to bring to the table. I've got a, a ministry friend uh, who preaches for the church in Boone, North Carolina. So obviously they're in the middle of a lot of stuff right now. And he posted yesterday, the day before, uh, this picture. And he said, this guy, uh, I don't remember his name, doesn't matter because none of us know him. He said, this guy didn't call ahead of time. He just drove from Maryland, the coast of Maryland, and drove to Boone, North Carolina with a truck full of generators, um, extension cords, tanks, gas tanks full of gas, um, bleach, a whole truckload full of stuff just showed up at the Boone Church, and they said, and they found out he had paid for all of it. And so my preacher friend said, why? And here's what he said. He just said, I just felt like I needed to do something. Now, in a situation like what's happened in the Carolinas through the hurricane, obviously all of us have a little bit of that sense. We want to do something. But here's what's unique about this story. Here's a guy, I don't know anything about him. None of us would know anything about him except for the fact he just saw a need, apparently had the financial resources to go buy some fairly expensive stuff and then had apparently a day off and some time to use it to serve other people. You know what he did? He brought what he had. Now, this was big. This feels bigger. But what I'm saying is on a daily basis, if we're all members of the body of Christ, all of us can do something like that. We bring what we have, our opportunities, our talents, our experiences, our personality, we bring that to the table and we say, okay, how can I serve? And here's one of the key things. If you're looking for someone else to tell you, that's, we'll try, come to one of the elders or, or, and say, you know, I wanna serve, I wanna do more, help me figure that out. But in a lot of ways, the healthiest, the healthiest way that you can live this out is if you can kind of learn on your own, here's what I'm good at and I'm gonna go do that every day. Or I'm gonna look for ways to do this every day or every week. So if this is true, like what are the takeaways? How do you put this into action? Again, we'll come back and revisit this next week and, and lay this out a little bit more. Here's just a couple of suggestions or reminders. We've already said this, every member has a role to play. Even if you feel like mine is not very important or nobody's gonna, I think about the guy who drove from here. Had they not posted a picture, nobody would have known. Like a lot of the roles and the ways that we serve others, nobody's going to know about. But do you remember what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6? You don't do it for others' attention anyway. You do, it for, you do it for my attention. God sees. God notices. Every member has a role to play. Number two, your role is important even if it seems like it's not. We're going to come back to this one next week when Paul spells this out explicitly with the parts of the body. So you may think, I... It's not important. It is important even if you seem like whatever role or whatever parts you play, it is vitally important. Even if nobody else, but nobody else knows about it. And I think I could go as far to say as what we'll see next week is it's probably more important than some of the things that everybody else knows about. And then this is important, an important reminder. If we're going to be real followers of Jesus, your role or your thing that you do does not have to take place in the church building. In fact, I would just go ahead and venture to say it's probably better if it doesn't. Now, I'm thankful for all, everybody who serves inside the walls of these buildings and facilities we have here. That's important, that's necessary, and, and we're able to do what we do and serve in special ways. But for most of us on the average week, we spend a, at most five hours here. And that's the most. That's getting here early, staying a little bit late five hours. If the only way you ever use your talents to glorify God is in those five hours a week, then I'm not thinking that's what Paul has in mind here. I'm not thinking that God gave you the abilities he gave you and said, okay, just five hours a week. 
And really, maybe for some of you, it's like, well, I, I do this one thing for 10 minutes when I'm at the building, and that, that kind of, no. Imagine what you could do if you used your talents, personality, and experiences outside the walls of this building, throughout the week, on the job, at home, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, wherever that is, if you were looking for those opportunities. Imagine what God could do if we did, if we took this seriously. And here's the reality. A church on mission, a church that is healthy, and a church that is going to grow in the future is not focused on what it does inside the walls of the building. It gathers as God's people as fuel so that we can say, look what we're going to do when we go out of the walls of this building all week long. That's what it looks like to be on mission. Yes, what we do here is important. We need this. This is vital. But imagine if we used our Sunday and Wednesday gatherings, these four or five hours that we're together, as fuel to be launched out into the week and doing all of this and using what God has given us to serve others. Imagine, imagine what, what God could do if all of us did this the rest of the week. Now, I'm thankful that a lot of, a lot of us do. I'm just challenging you to think through what this could look like for you throughout the week. Just Maybe I guess it is just to ask this question. Here's the last question I want you to think about. How can I use my unique talents, personality, and experiences to serve others? It's a simple question, but as the body of Christ with diverse members, diverse parts, we're all different, all of us have to be asking this question. Now, there are church leaders here who will help you with this if you want some help. But I want to challenge you to kind of wrestle with this on your own and think outside the walls of the building and the way that you interact on a daily basis how can you use your unique talents, personality, and experience to serve others here? Yes, sometimes, but the rest of the week to serve the world around us so that others will glorify God in the process. Imagine what God could do. Several years ago, I knew of a, a kid who didn't have, a, didn't have like a whole lot of money, I don't guess. Um, grew up in a, a house, they were, they were middle class people. Um, and their, their family ran an auction barn, right? And so he knew of another family that was, needed some help, had some need, and he was 15 years old, and I don't know what his thought process was. I'm gonna move Mrs. Potato Head off the stage because that'll be, re be really distracting later on. Um, he was, again, trying to figure out what he could do, and I don't know what led him to this conclusion, but he decided, you know what, maybe for this family that, that could use some help, um, I'll, I'll do an auction. And so he started at 15-year-old. He started advertising and getting word out and then did this at their auction barn, hosted this auction. And on that single day, he raised $13,000 for the family. Knew, knew, know this situation, situation well. 13, a 15-year-old kid who probably didn't feel like he could do anything. You know what he did? He used what he knew and maybe a little bit of talent that other people didn't have and he used that to serve others. Again, what if every member of the body of Christ, maybe not a big way where you're raising thousands of dollars, but every day, what if we were looking for ways to use our unique talents, personality, and experiences to serve others? I just can't imagine what God would do if we were willing to serve in that way. I know that many of you are, and I'm thankful for that, but all of us just need to re-ask this question occasion. And I hope you'll wrestle with this in the coming week, and we'll come back and visit this later this week. If you're not a member of the body of Christ, we want you to be connected to the body and you can become a member of the body of Christ today by being baptized into the body of Christ. As we talked about in our class, putting to death the previous life and being raising from the dead to walk in newness of life with Jesus Christ. We would love to help you with that. If you just need prayers, if you need some help being more connected to this body or, or you just need prayers because you're struggling, I know this body will connect with you and help you in any way that you, we possibly can while we stand and sing together. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and give.